This conference will now be recorded. So it's 11 o'clock, I think I can start. Uh, welcome to ASNEX Virtual Cardiovascular Molecular Imaging Seminars. This is seminar number four. And as you know, this series of seminars are to promote molecular imaging within the nuclear uh, cardiology and uh, uh, scientific community. We've had a very successful set of seminars up to now, and I'm sure it's be, it will continue like this today. We have faculty from many top medical institutions that are listed here, and we have had attendees from uh, at least 27 countries, and it keeps uh, growing. And I remind you that ASNIC members are present in 62 countries. So the topic today is new technologies in nuclear cardiology, part two. Our speakers are Rob Ropler, uh, uh, laboratory of Mark Dweck, and the discussant is Peter Caravan, and I'm Miran Sadegi, the moderator. Just a few housekeeping uh, tips. So all attendees are muted by default. And then please remember to mute your uh, microphone because it helps as it helps to minimize the background noise. Uh, this is going to be an interactive uh, uh, seminar, so there is a question and answer session at the end of each presentation, and you can uh, contribute to this or ask uh, questions using the chat feature. To, did, to do this, you have to click on the chat bo uh, uh, button on the top of your screen and then type in the window on the right side of your screen and then everyone, everyone will see your messages. So please uh, be mindful of that. Uh, I'm also reminding everybody that this uh, presentation will be audio and vi uh, video recorded and available on the ASNIC website. So if your web camera is on, everybody will see you and you'll be recorded. So I start with introducing the speakers. It's really an honor to have uh, the speakers of today's speakers. First speaker is Rob Ropler. He is the senior vice chair and director in the division of uh, radiological sciences in Malinfort Institute of Radiology, uh, Washington University in St. Louis. And uh, Rob is uh, very well known in the field. His research interests are in the development and validation of new quantitative tools to measure myocardial oxygen, glucose, and fatty acid metabolism using various PET radio tracers. And uh, he is now extending these to preclinical uh, and first in human evaluation of new PET radio tracers to assess the downstream effects of these metabolic changes. Uh, Rob has had um, has more than 150 publications. He's editor-in-chief of Circulation Cardiovascular Imaging, and uh, he's also a PI on an NIH uh, P41 pro uh, uh, program, the PET Radio Tracer Translation and Resource Center. Uh, the second speaker is from the laboratory of Mark Dr. Dweck. Uh, Dr. Dweck is from a British Heart Foundation and he's a reader in cardiology. He's a consultant cardiologist in the University of Edinburgh and uh, uh, Edinburgh Heart Center. His research interests are in multimodality imaging to improve understanding of cardiovascular pathophysiology with focus on atherosclerosis and plaque rupture 
aortic stenosis and cardiomyopathy. He has uh, more than 200 publications and multiple uh, awards, including Michael Davis Early Career Award from the British Cardiovascular Society, St. Jules Thorne Award for Biomedical Research, British Heart Foundation Outstanding Investigator Award, uh, William Palmley Prize from Jack. Um, he's a member. He's a member of multiple editorial boards and chief investigator of uh, Saltire 2 and Evolve trials on aortic stenosis. Uh, from Dr. Duex laboratory, we have Dr. Fletcher, Alexander Fletcher. He's a British Heart Foundation Clinical Research Fellow uh, in congenital heart failure, uh, congenital heart disease, and uh, his supervisors are Dr. Nubi and Duek from University of Edinburgh. His uh, research interests are in uh, sodium fluoride PET CT and PET MRI in thoracic aortic disease to assess association between aortic valve and microcalcification and disease progression. And he's had He's been the first in Scotland for uh, pediatric subspecialty training, uh, Carl Zeiss Prize for first in class and academic excellence, and recipient of Chief Medical Officer Grant, Chief Medical Office Grant to perform sodium fluoride micropet CT autoradiography and histological analysis uh, for bioprosthetic bio bio valves in congenital heart disease. The discussant is Dr. Peter Caravan. Dr. Caravan is a, an associate professor in radiology at Harvard Medical School and co-director uh, of the Institute for Innovation in Imaging at Massachusetts General Hospital. His research interests are in using extens uh, his extensive experience in chemistry, biophysics, and imaging, including complex instrumentation to translate innovations in radiology into first in human studies and he's been focusing on the development of fibrin targeted probes for thrombus imaging as well as uh, molecular probes for imaging fibrosis and uh, fibrogenesis imaging uh, and again translation in humans he's authored more than 150 publications he is the distinguished investigator from academy of Radio uh, radiology research uh, he's on the board of trustees for Bo of uh, world molecular imaging society and the chair of molecular and cellular study group at ISMRM, and he's also on uh, numerous editorial advisory boards. Just a reminder about uh, the next session, which is going to be on Wednesday instead of Tuesdays, and from next week we're going to have one session per week on Wednesdays from 11 to 12, and the topic of next week's uh, presentation is valvular calcification, and the didactic lecture will be presented by Dr. Elena Aikawa from Harvard Medical School, and the research presentation will be from the laboratory of Dr. Piotr Slomka from Cedar Sinai Medical School, and the discussion will be Dr. Jagat Narula from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. The moderator would be Vunan Zhu. Just a, remi uh, a reminder also, just a quick reminder about some of the awards and resources that are available for young, young investigators. ASMIC has a young investigator award competition for the annual meeting and they have, we have some uh, uh, research grants, both general and amyloidosis related, and you have the deadlines there and you can refer to these and I hope you will ap consider applying to these. And at the end, there will be a questionnaire. You see the link here and please uh, fill in uh, take, the, your, take a short time to fill in that survey. And with this, I'm going to ask Dr. Grockler to take over the screen. Great. Do I have to do anything or can you guys see my screen? Uh, I, they're going to change, they're going to make you the presenter and switch right. this. So you should be able to, so much, let me know if you can see my screen. Do I, do I need to do anything? Jocelyn, can you put Dr. Grappler's screen up. Oh, it's going up now. We see a screen, Rob. Uh, 
Rob, we see your screen, but we don't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you now. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is interesting. I'm used to Zoom, not this one. So it's a, it's a new learning process every day. Anyway, uh, Mehran, thank you. And uh, welcome, everyone. And I first want to, again, uh, express my appreciation, gratitude, and for Mehran and uh, Shramila for putting this together and inviting me to participate. It's, been, it's really quite an educational process, and I think you're doing quite a service to the community. So what I've been tasked to do today was to give a bit of some comments on novel tracer development and discovery from discovery to approval. Um, these are just my, let's see if it's going to work this way. Okay, one second. The mouse is not moving for me. Hold on. Let's try this. There we go. I'll just use this. Okay, so those are my disclosures. Uh, nothing of significance here other than one of the traces I'll talk about very quickly. We have a patent on. Um, so the summary of the talk is very straightforward. One is why do we even want to do this kind of work? And I mean, because if we don't understand the why, there's no reason to go forward. Then what are the hurdles that we are currently uh, seeing as we try to take new tracers from thought to human? Then how do we get over those hurdles? And then lastly, what's the future hold once we do get over those hurdles? So I'm going to try and touch on each of those high notes through the course of the talk. Yeah, I use this. So Let's first, and I'm going to focus this on atherosclerosis, um, just to, in rather cardiovascular disease in general. If we look at atherosclerosis alone, in 2016, it killed more than 9 million people. To put that in perspective, that is the equivalent of New York, of taking out New York City every year. So it's a huge problem from a healthcare perspective worldwide. But beyond the clinical aspects of it, the, the financial ones are significant. If we just look at U.S. dollars alone, in 2030, the projected total cost in 2012 dollars, so total cost for both the diagnostic downstream as well as cost due to lost work, things like that, to treat patients just with atherosclerosis and, and its complications, not any other forms of cardiovascular disease, are going to equal a half a trillion dollars. Again, to put that in perspective, that is the equivalent of 43% of our current discretionary budget for the U.S. government, or 17 times the NIH budget. So these are huge problems that are facing us both now and in the future. Another problem that we're having is that the pathophysiology of atherosclerosis is changing in front of our eyes. We now realize it's a systemic disease with local effects. Inflammation plays a key role. We also know that its presentations evolve. You know, 20 years ago, STEMIs were the major form of presentation. We now know that non-STEMIs are the most common form of presentation, and plaque erosion is actually uh, more common than plaque rupture. And just a picture of that very quickly. We also know, as we understand now, the genetics, the epigenetics, genomic information. Again, the disease is variable across individuals, and the disease presentation and his progression changes as we add therapies. So what does this mean? It means that we're going to need new diagnostic and therapeutic paradigms. And more importantly, it's telling us that the experimental models we use for disease, all APOE models, LDR knockouts, take your choice, don't really recapitulate the human disease. So we're going to have to do the fundamental studies in humans. The only way we're going to be able to do that is with imaging. In parallel with this is now we're starting to see a renaissance in drug discovery and development. If you look on this graph to the left, we're now seeing an increase in what would you would call new biological pathways in terms of cardiovascular drugs. Prior to this, we were just seeing reconstitution of drugs or combinations thereof, but now we're actually seeing new, uh, new compounds, both small molecules and biologics, which means that we're going to have to do a better job of understanding their target engagement, their off-target effects, and so on. 
Moreover, we also know that when you look at drug development, why does it discontinue in phase three? Nearly 70% is either because of efficacy issues or safety issues. So this is really an opportunity for imaging to help again us understand when a drug is engaging the target, how does the target change, and then correlating those changes with the desired functional or physiological outcome. So this is really the nuts and bolts of the talk. This is a summary of at least how I look at the translational pathway for new tracer development and what it's going to take for us to shorten this tracer, this translational pathway. In the center, you have the various components or key steps. The most important one is that the target you're choosing has to be a viable target. And that means, is it clinically relevant? Is it, is it one that you can possibly, in fact, image if possible? Two, once you get to that, how do I then design a probe that, in fact, will image or, or get us to that target? And in the process, if we look at what we call enabling opportunities, is the target itself ubiquitous or, or specific to the heart? Because if it's ubiquitous, meaning it's, made, it's involved in many diseases, now you've got a much greater application for your potential probe, which is much better than a very specific one. Two, that you, it is detectable, that's important. But three, is there pharmaceutical or interventional, interventional you know, therapies or whatnot interest in this target? Because when you have that in parallel, now you have a reason to develop the target because you have a therapy that may be tied to it. Then we get in the probe design, and this can go from anywhere from what types of probes, small molecules, peptides, is your goal if you want to look at, you know, if you want to look at cross blood brain barrier, you've got to use a different type of probe. Is it endovascular? Is it intracellular? All these things go in the probe design. I, I can't get into that today. But once you look, you, you have that in mind, you can use various omic assays, tissue biobanks, high throughput screening to enhance both the targeting and help you with your probe design in optimizing that probe for what you're trying to image. Then when you decide, I've got that, now I want to have to do all the preclinical, the cell assays, disease models, and imaging in a preclinical setting to validate those steps. And those all have to occur fairly quickly. But what I would argue here is that what you want to do at this step is really engage human tissue very early on to ensure that, in fact, your probe, one, number one, you have an expression of the target, but two, that your probe is binding to the target of interest. And then once you've got to that preclinical stage, now you got to go to the first in man. And this is all the regulatory approval steps, toxicity, uh, exploratory IND, and so on. And here the enabling technology is really centers of excellence that do this routinely. Yale does this routinely, we do this routinely, MGH does this routinely. You need centers that you can partner with so that they can help take these tracers quickly from the preclinical phase into man. Then once you've gotten into man and you've said, okay, it's safe to use, the radiation dose symmetry is appropriate, and it's doing what it's supposed to do, now we can start moving the more clinical trials again to see just where does this, where should this tracer be positioned? And in that, in that case, it may be some other trials that you may want to work in concert with, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but concert trials that are already ongoing that you could use your tracer to understand, is it a prognosticator? Is it a th potential linkage with a theranostic? And again, here we would want to use the oncology world as our model to help us because they're doing this routinely. And then you finally get to regulatory approval. Now here, again, we're going to have to optimize not just doing the study, but analyzing the study. Because molecular imaging signals in general are lower than more physiologic or metabolic signals, we're going to need motion correction to enhance that signal. We're going to need quantitative imaging analytical tools to help us better identify and quantify the signal. And ultimately, I think machine learning, AI, take your choice, is going to have to help us in that regard. And the goal here is to speed up this process because one of the fastest drugs I've ever seen get to regulatory approval still took almost not, not, it took about seven to eight years to get there. And even just to get first in man, it took eight years. So again, these are the types of uh, hurdles we want to get around because unless 
you can speed this process up, you'll never stay aligned with the pharmaceutical development, and you'll never be able to ultimately get that link of your imaging agent to your therapeutic. So I'm going to use very quickly our work with our chemokine imaging agents to show you how this was done for us fairly quickly. This work mostly done by Yang Jin Wu. Chemokine system very quickly is a complex system. Think of it as a signaling system that, that traffics the immune cells, both innate and adaptive immune cells, to responses based on where the, where the response is needed. In this case, it's atherosclerosis. So when you get uh, lipid accumulation within the this mouse is not great, I apologize, within the endothelium, you'll get MCP1, a protein that will trigger release of pro-inflammatory monocytes from the bone marrow and ultimately the spleen to go to the site of the atheroma. These monocytes, the way this works is the C it's, there's a receptor, CCR2, that's expressed. This receptor then uh, is, a, is a targetable agent to look at pro-inflammatory trafficking to the atheroma. You can look at other chemokine agents such as CCR5 that looks at the incorporation of the monocytes into the uh, neo-intimate, into the intimate itself, and ultimately the expression is in terms of macrophages. You can look at more broad spectrum chemokines to look at all the steps of the atherosclerotic process. I'm going to talk about CCR2 because it allows us to look at the immune cell trafficking to the site of the atheroma. So what we did... Let's see if I can, my mouse here is having trouble. There we go. Okay, so first, the first question is, is a receptor um, expressed in human tissue and also where does it co-localize? These are just expression of inflammatory macrophages, looking at CD68, which are obviously macrophages, biodiversity, which are foam cells, they're in green, CCR2 is in red. You can see the CCR2 is co-localizing with the CD68 macrophages, mostly in the neo intima, as opposed to more throughout the uh, atheroma, which is one would see with the uh, foam cells. If we then look at the, how we develop a tracer, we, uh, we work with Chris Condier and Inserm to develop, a, where he developed a small peptide that could then be radio labeled either directly via chelation with copper 64, or as a nanomaterial, again, labeled with copper 64. And what was shown, done here was using a lung transplant model. So what happens is lung transplant, you get immediate ischemia reperfusion injury, rejection, and you get a high increase in CCR2 cells. And what one can see here is when one goes from wild type to wild type, you see the increase in signal consistent with the um, uh, CCR2 cells. In, con in contrast, when you when you um, transplant a wild-type heart into a CCR2 knockout, one does not see the signal. And then you can just follow that through here. Again, looking at native to donor, CCR2 knockout is much lower than the wild-type. The, wild type. the signal here at all is due to the residual CCR2 cells in the wild-type lung. I'm not going to talk about the nanoprobe, but this just was the original validation. We then... We did many other studies, but one study just showed that if you could look at atherosclerosis um, regression, you know, what's done is you take the aortic arch from an APOE mouse that's been made hyperlipidemic, you then transplant it into a B6 mouse, and you'll see atherosclerosis regression. And that's what you see here. Here's a B6 to B6, APOE to B6, no big surprise. You still have atherosclerosis, but as you one looks at the signal, you see a decrease over time consistent with a decrease in the atherosclerotic process. And again, a decrease, and just, just showing you the CCR2 cells. But what this allowed us to do was to look at the um, regression of atherosclerosis. So the next question, and again, many other studies, but that's just one. The other question is, is does it bind to human tissue? that expresses CCR2, and these are, this is work again from Yangjin and Mohamed Zayed, a vascular surgeon, just showing very nicely, these are samples from carotid end arterectomies, femoral end arterectomies, just showing the H&E stains, CD68, CCR2, and then those all together, the co-localization, and the autoradiography showing you very nicely how the CCR2 uh, signal on the autoradiographic um, 
slice. Matches fairly nicely with the CD68, and you have fairly good co-localization. We're seeing the same thing in ephemeral uh, and orthorectomy sample. So that was very quickly to show that we we took a process that was important atherosclerosis that looked at it early on in terms of its dynamics that would allow us also to look at the systemic nature because we could also look at the bone marrow and spleen. We demonstrated it was upregulated in humans. We showed that it could bind to the, trait, to the receptor in humans and that we did the quickly multiple animal models in parallel to show that it was actually detecting various stages of atherosclerosis. So the next step then is you then have to go through the dosimetry and the tox tox toxicology to the EIND. I'm not going to get into that in huge detail. Suffice it to say that's about a $100,000 proposition, at least in our hands, to take it through that stage alone. So, um, but once you can do that, you can do a first in man trial. as it was done here. This is just a normal uh, volunteer showing you the distribution of the tracer over time. And what you eventually get an effective dose that allows you then to decide what amount of tracer can I give safely for uh, this, this type of study. We've now taken this to humans. This is one example of a normal volunteer and their PET CT showing you that you know there's no uptake of tracer anywhere, nowhere on the PET CT. That same patient in the transverse uh, cut in the neck, we don't see any coronary or any calcium, no CCR2, whereas in a separate patient, you're seeing a, a increase in calcium in the carotid and there is CCR2 in that area. So we have proof of concept that we can do this. We now have a grant to look at this more systematically. So just this whole process took six years to get us from the initial peptide that we had up to this to where we are today. So what are some of the other enabling technologies that we're going to need if this is going to really work long term? One is that we really have to improve upon both signal uh, uh, acquisition and quantif quantification. To the left is an example from Munoz who did some motion correction. And it was a very nice study where they used various forms of motion correction. And here you can see this is a pet viability study. And um, you can see the reduced um, blood flow here, and then we also have the reduced activity here, and then the same over here and over here, we have this reduced activity. But if you look at the LGE samples, what do you see? Is that in fact, you get better resolution, if you will, of the defect, you can begin to see RB with a motion correction versus non-motion correction. The other aspect that will help us, because again, these are low signal targets, is machine learning to help us enhance those. This is actually work from the from Lou, at, uh, Lou Group at Yale. Well, what they did was they took a bunch of FDG CT studies for lung uh, cancer, and they looked at a standard PET, but then they modeled a low-dose PET, which would mimic a low-signal environment, and then looked at various types of machine learning algorithms to just show that, in fact, one could recapitulate that same signal that you got in a standard pet using these machine learning algorithms. So you have to put all this stuff together when you're thinking about your tracers and your tracer development so that you can ultimately get a signal that you can quantify routinely in these situations where in fact the signal intensity is not that high. Quantitation is also going to be important. This is just one of our patients with the same CCR2 probe who is post-MI. As you know, post-MI patients have increased inflammation, a big influx of pro-inflammatory monocytes early post-infarction to help in the remodeling process. This is just a spec CT showing you the decreased blood flow, the PET CT showing you the increased signal, and then a volume, and this is just a parametric image looking at the volume of distribution of the PET tracer in the myocardium. And the reason why this becomes important is because now I can begin to look at the, my the signal in non-infarcted tissue and begin to understand the physiological or biological ramifications of the signal or the receptor expression in these other areas, which may be very important in disease such as LV remodeling. So you've got a tracer. You've gone through the first in man studies. 
you look promising, you maybe you've done a clinical trial that says it looks interesting. How do we get into the steps where we can get the FDA approval and things like that and really show it works? Well, there, it probably would be most useful if we can tag on to current drug trials or other intervention trials, as well as other approaches to help in this regard. And that's what I'm showing you here. One of the most important ones is, again, how do we standardize the signal that we get? You know, the way I measure a signal may be different than the way Mayron measures a signal, the more way Peter measures a signal. How do we get it so that if you're going to use it in a broad way, like we do with myocardial perfusion imaging, how do we standardize those? What are the quantitative imaging and analytical tools that will do that? Here we want to learn from others that have done this, such as AC, well, ECOG and ACRI. And the, um, we have, the, our, in our case, the CNDA here, in a, or, as well as the QIA network and the Quantitative Imaging and Biomarkers Alliance. You also want to do bioinformatics. The way, you know, so again, how do we get this so that we can have large trials that will have large pieces of large data sets pulled in that will permit not just you know, evaluation of large patients, but reevaluation by others who may be able to improve upon those tools. So again, we need the data, the data informatics to help us do that. I'm just showing you one example from our place. As I mentioned at the beginning of the slide, we want to leverage what we have with the imaging with diagnostics. So can we leverage ongoing trials, such as this case, the attribute trial, which is looking at a new um, uh, ATTR amyloid agent, or the Reprieve 7500 trial, which is looking at patients with um, HIV and following those and looking at the inflammatory status that looks at after and how we can mitigate that. So these are two large trials where, again, perhaps using just, you know, pyrophosphate imaging might be helpful, or may perhaps our inflammation imaging age or others in this trial. And again, why is this important? Um, very quickly here, this is just a Dow outcome study. You, this is an HDL uh, ag, uh, agent you know, designed to increase HDL, thought to be cardioprotective. You see here that they, they got their target. HDL is increased with therapy. However, Cardiac event rates didn't change with the two um, with the intervention, even though you reached your target blood-wise. Why was that? Because if you look at the arterial inflammation, these were not uh, statistically significant when evaluated by FDG. So even though you got a you 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 got your goal pharmacologically, you didn't get your endpoint because you didn't have the biologic effect you desired, decreasing inflammation in this case. And so again, a place where cardiac imaging could be helpful, or molecular imaging could be helpful. And just again, in the oncologic space, they're doing this routinely with FDG, looking at patients who in fact respond by having a reduction in their FDG signal with uh, anti with anti-cancer therapies. They do better than those that don't. So again, there's models for this that we need to follow. Again, we need centers of excellence. This is just ours at PET RTRC, where we're working nationwide to develop these PET radio trains and to distribute them and work with our investigators around the country, now as well as in Europe. And so where does this leave us? What's the future hold? Well, if you've, if you've seen my talks, heard my talks, you know you've seen the slide in some iteration slightly. If you have any kind of memory, you'll, you'll see this date keeps getting pushed further into the future. But I do think this is going to happen, where we're now going to use molecular imaging in concert for diagnostics and therapeutics in various patient populations. In this case, patient comes in, let's say, with an ACS, you will define them as being high risk based on your various databases, biomarkers, and clinical factors. You will image to see where are the lesions of interest, because some may be amenable to interventions versus not. You're going to want to know how active is the systemic uh, how much systemic activation there is, not just from plasma, but also as the spleen and uh, bone marrow is still hot, which means that there's still a lot of reservoir for uh, these immune cells to come out to get your intensive therapies to then quiescent this state biomarkers to document you've had this uh, state, uh, in fact, be reduced, and then you now have a stable patient. In, in parallel, you'll do your adjuvant therapies to, again, reach a state. If you don't see a change in improvement, 
then you have to go back, maybe re-image and change dosing, change drugs. Rather than keep people on forever, change based on the imaging, very similar to a cancer environment. So that's really my talk. And like I said, I started out with why is this an important problem? I think using atherosclerosis, hopefully I've convinced you of that. What are the steps, what are the challenges one needs to do to get into you know, these tracers quickly in the humans? I, we've stepped through those. I'll give you one example from our place, as well as what my, at least my vision is of the future of where we'll use these probes. And I'll stop there, thank you. That was a great talk. Um, are there any questions? If you have any questions for doc, Dr. Grappler, you can put them into the uh, into the chat, and I'll I'll bring them up. And and while we're waiting for questions, um, I've got a few. Um, so Rob, you know, one one question I had for you was, what do you think makes a, a good tracer? And by that I mean, what's good enough? You know, can you speak about the balance between you know needing to improve once you're mm -hmm. in humans? Uh, with the the need to standardize, and I'm thinking here about an oncology, you know, where with uh, Integrin Alpha V Beta three, there were so many different uh, mm -hmm. molecules that were used in clinical research, and now we're seeing that again with PSMA, and um, you know, so obviously there's a balance here between one wants to have the the best probe, but uh, one also wants to be able to compare across centers. What's your thought on that? Yeah, I think that. And it's a great question, Peter, thank you. I think there's two parts to this. The first one is, if the probe is telling me enough, meaning I'm getting enough signal to detect what I want, then the next step for me is, how widely distributable and usable is this probe? And so that means, you know, because let's face it, the only way these probes are really gonna be helpful is if a lot of people can use them. And so there, you really wanna look at the business model for how would I get these probes to people and how easy would the imaging be with the probe? And when those two things are married reasonably well, I think they go hand in hand. That's what I think you run with. I think the problem we have now is, as you said, we keep trying to improve. But if you can, if your probe fits what your hypothesized goal or your gold standard is, and that works and it's readily distributable, that's the one I would run with. I wouldn't keep trying to improve upon it because I think. At some point, you know, it, it becomes counterproductive. And you, and you, you mentioned in there as well, um, you know, that it's good enough. And, and um, did you, can you also speak a little bit about validation in humans? You talked about validation in, uh, you know, preclinically. Um, yeah, no, again, great question. And there's two ways to validate in humans, at least that I think about. The one way which I prefer, at least the initial validation, is, and that's the first in man where, you, I'm not saying the safety bio-D, but the validation component. That one I prefer to take patients, even if they're not in the exact disease you're interested in, but close, where I can image them and I can get tissue, uh, contemporary tissue, to validate that one, the, the um, expression of the target is up, to my tracer is binding to the target. And the reason why that's important, uh, and ideally if three, it's, it's pathologically relevant. But the first two are most important because one, you want to make, it helps you with how much non-specific uptake you may have. But two, very often what works in animals doesn't work in humans. And if, it, and if you find that your binding is really good on the targeting, on the trace, on the tissue, but your imaging isn't very good, well, that then helps me say, well, you know what? I've got to do something to play with the pharmacodynamics to improve what I'm getting, what I'm seeing in tissue. Conversely, if it's not binding in tissue, then I got a problem with my targeting and I got to go back and change that completely. The other way you can do it is with a, we're doing this now with an S1P1 agent in multiple sclerosis, is to do a drug intervention where you know the drug will change the expression of the target you're looking at. And then you look at the change in your draw in your uh, imaging agent or signal before and after therapy. Okay, I think it's time to move on to the next speaker, Rob. Thank you so much for this uh, great presentation. I think we have this slide up for uh, uh, Dr. Fletcher. Yeah. Hello. Can you can you all hear me now? 
Yes. Great. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much uh, for the invite to speak um, today. Um, I've attended all of the uh, sessions so far, and the bar is really very high. So I hope I can uh, meet that standard. Um, and I suppose following on from Dr. Groppler, uh, his talk there, um, our talk is going to focus on uh, measuring disease using PET in aortic stenosis. And this is going to be a uh, very human focused. Uh, so uh, unlike the previous uh, speakers uh, of this session that have uh, mostly focused on preclinical, this is very much heading towards clinical and human use. Um, so uh, this is almost a redundant slide to this audience um, because you all very, know, very well know the benefits of what molecular imaging adds. Um, conventional imaging gives us excellent uh, anatomical uh, information, but it doesn't tell us anything about the disease processes and disease mechanisms, which is what PET adds. So here in Edinburgh, we have a hybrid PET CT imager, um, and that combines the uh, information that we can get from PET on disease mechanism, which is uh, very sensitive and can pick up things that conventional imaging cannot. And you fuse that with uh, conventional imaging such as CT, and you then have uh, anatomical specificity, which gives you a fantastically powerful tool to investigate uh, human diseases. And this is a, an example of a, a patient um, who's had sodium fluoride, um, and uh, this is their aortic valve lighting up, and you can co-localize that very nicely. Um, so our lab focuses primarily on uh, two agents um, at the moment, and those are uh, FDG, which as you all know is a, a marker of glucose metabolism and usually um, highlighting non-specific inflammation. Um, and the one which I'm going to be talking mostly about today is sodium fluoride. Um, and uh, so uh, we've taken advantage of the fact that sodium fluoride has been around for over 40 years used in prostate cancer, um, which means that we haven't had to jump through all those ho hoops of first in man. Um, we've just taken the tracer and applied it to cardiovascular diseases. Um, now, Peter Libby last week mentioned that if you're using a, a radio tracer, you should know exactly what you're measuring. Um, so taking this into cardiovascular diseases, we, look, we started by looking at sodium fluoride in explanted uh, carotid plaques. Um, so this is energy dispersion x-ray on those explanted plaques and you can see that sodium fluoride or the fluoride is incorporating itself within the, uh, the calcium phosphate which is what we already knew that um, the fluoride sodium fluoride bound to is uh, hydroxyapatite crystals or essentially calcium phosphate. Um, the next thing we did was we compared um, how it binds in those large macro calcified plaques that you'd be able to see on conventional CT imaging um, compared to the microcalcification or the areas of developing calcification that you may not be able to see on conventional imaging and, of course, controls. And very interestingly, the fluoride signal um, was much higher in the microcalcification than macrocalcification. Um, and this uh, can be explained. This is a very simple diagram which is explaining uh, why that is. And it's simply because the uh, in microcalcification, the surface area that the sodium fluoride has to bind to is much higher than in the macro calcified plaque where you just have binding to the surface layer, but it is not penetrating deeper into the plaque. Um, so why would we want to image uh, micro calcification or, um, or developing calcification, or as we like to think of it, calcification activity in cardiovascular diseases? Um, cardiovascular, in, in uh, cardiovascular disease, um, in specifically in the vasculature, um, developing calcification accumulates in response to vascular injury. Um, and this is a summary slide, um, which uh, is a, a summary of all of our recent publications um, utilizing sodium fluoride in humans in cardiovascular diseases. Um, so as we started with, we've looked at um, sodium fluoride or calcification activity in uh, carotid plaques and atherosclerosis, looking at uh, eventual risk of stroke. Um, excitingly, um, we're looking at sodium fluoride activity in, um, in 
coronary arteries. Um, it's also been used to look at the cavernous artery um, and has been associated with erectile dysfunction. Um, the focus of the talk today is going to be on uh, aortic stenosis, um, where sodium fluoride has been used to identify areas of developing calcification, and similarly in bioprosthetic valves, uh, where it may well be a useful early marker of uh, degeneration. It's also been used in differentiating different types of uh, amyloid, um, and as we discussed on a little bit on Tuesday, um, sodium fluoride has also been recently used in identifying high-risk abdominal aneurysms. And uh, that's actually a, a translation of that is uh, part of my grant, which is to look at uh, sodium fluoride uptake in uh, high-risk thoracic aneurysms to see if it can predict disease progression. Um, but the focus of the talk today is going to be primarily on uh, aortic stenosis. Um, so for those of you that aren't clinical, aortic stenosis is, is essentially a disease of the uh, um, leaflets of the aortic valve, where the uh, aortic valve becomes stiff, making it more difficult for uh, the heart to pump blood around the body. And this ends up uh, in left ventricular remodeling um, and can lead to heart failure and arrhythmias carrying a lot of uh, morbidity with it. Um, the current treatment is to replace the valve, either surgically or transcatheter, um, and there are no current medical therapies that target the progression of this, um, despite uh, a lot of uh, trying. Um, so in the early noughties, um, we conducted Saltire, the first Saltire trial, uh, which was essentially based around the premise that patients with uh, aortic stenosis and those with coronary artery disease have a very similar risk profile. Um, and if statins were useful in preventing the uh, events in uh, coronary artery disease, they may well be useful in uh, aortic stenosis. And the answer we got from that trial, that trial was negative and four subsequent RCTs have uh, confirmed that statins don't play much of a role at all in uh, preventing the progression of aortic stenosis. Um, so that led to our first study using uh, PET in aortic stenosis, where we uh, essentially used um, sodium fluoride and FDDG to uh, explore the, the, the mechanisms of, that were driving the disease process in aortic stenosis. So we took 100 patients with a, a variety of degrees of aortic stenosis and 20 controls. Um, and you can see very clearly that it is the um, calcification activity, it's the sodium fluoride in these white bars here, that is clearly the driver of disease activity beyond the uh, inflammation, which essentially had very little or no uh, correlation with the severity of disease. And this was different to what we saw in the atheroma and the ascending aorta, which was more uh, driven by inflammation than it was for, for calcification. And this is an illustration of exactly what we're seeing on our scans. So uh, on the left here, we have our baseline CT, and this is a patient with aortic sclerosis, mild stenosis, and moderate stenosis. And uh, in the middle here, we have uh, the sodium fluoride activity. And you can see that the fluoride activity is very different to the uh, where we see these macro calcified areas, consistent with what, how we understand the mechanism of the tracer. And very excitingly, you can see that um, two years later on repeat CT, uh, very discreetly, these areas of mac that are now macrocalcified were predicted by the, the sodium fluoride or the calcium activity that we saw in our scans. Um, and this correlated with very strong correlation with baseline uh, sodium fluoride and progression of calcium score in the valve uh, over the two year period. And there was also a moderate. Uh, correlation uh, between baseline sodium fluoride and progression of gradient. And when we put that into a, a multivariate model, PET sodium fluoride was an independent predictor of clinical events. Very exciting. So um, how has our technology advanced and helped us um, go beyond what our initial findings were? Um, so contrast CT has helped us um, understand uh, a lot about the mechanisms of disease. 
So it provides a much better detail of the uh, valve that you can see here. You can see very clearly the individual leaflets. And this allowed us to see that the majority of the uptake is actually uh, where these leaflets are banging together, so the captation sites, uh, suggesting a possible mechanistic um, uh, role for um, calcium uh, activity being at these sites of high uh, impact. Um, and also you can see that um, it helps us delineate exactly what is valve uptake and what is roundabout potentially coronary uptake as you can see in 4B here. Um, and it's, it's really progressed uh, the detail we can look at these scans in. Um, and our signal to noise ratio is getting better and better. Um, and this is some work that is driven by uh, Dr. Slomka's lab in LA that we're collaborating with. Um, and we're essentially, um, the heart, as the heart moves, um, the PET signal can become dispersed. So uh, we perform what we call ECG gating, um, which essentially takes the, a snapshot of the um, uptake in one phase, in one gate. Um, and what the team in LA have managed to do is to come up with an algorithm that um, essentially takes uh, that one gate or follows through the entire cardiac cycle rather than just that one gate and localizes it to one point so that you're not disregarding uh, large amounts of data. Um, and uh, essentially, if you want to see, uh, uh, to read uh, uh, our view of how is best to measure uptake in the valve, uh, this review came out today. Um, so uh, if you just want to get a, 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 an understanding of what we think the best way to do it, uh, that's, that's worth a read. Um, so at the end of the day, um, now that we've got really good scan, rescan repeatability, um, that has implications for um, how we might be able to utilize uh, this really exciting biomarker in, in aortic stenosis that is essentially a very good marker of disease. Um, and to follow on from what Dr. Gropler was saying, if you wanted to, to, to look at a clinical trial, um, and we now know that um, sodium fluoride or calcium activity is the main driver of disease in aortic stenosis, um, then you could very well use sodium fluoride as your outcome marker of um, is your drug having an effect on disease in the valve? And the point about the repeatability um, is that now that we, our errors are very small, it means that the numbers you would need to detect those differences are actually getting smaller as well. So it means that in terms of costing for trials, uh, that cost is coming down. Um, and that need, leads me on nicely to uh, the SOLTAR-2 trial, um, where essentially uh, we're looking to target uh, calcium activity as the driver of disease. Um, so this is a forearm randomized control trial where we're using denosumab and alendronate, which, uh, so denosumab is a monoclonal antibody against Rankel, which inhibits osteoclastic activity, and alendronate bisphosphonate. And really what these things are doing is targeting the calcification within the valve. Um, we follow them up at six months CT and PET CT, um, so we can see whether these uh, drugs are having an effect on the calcium activity, which would be a really exciting thing to look at. Um, and we've, we, we look at them again at two years to see um, what's happening in terms of the calcification within the valve that we can see macroscopically, um, and also look at the, the gradients um, across the valve as well. Um, another trial which is coming out of the Netherlands is the BASIC-2 trial where they're using uh, vitamin K2 uh, which is a potent inhibitor, uh, sorry, activator of MGP, which is a, an inhibitor of vascular and valve calcification. Um, and just as, a, as a, an example, their trial numbers in each arm is two arms, uh, the vitamin K2 and placebo. And the numbers in that are very small, somewhere in the range of 25 patients per arm. Um, so makes this much more affordable. And uh, sodium fluoride, I should say, in the valve is the, is the primary outcome for this trial. Um, so very finally, I wanted to um, give you an update, uh, give an example of our work, uh, which is looking at uh, bioprosthetic valves. Um, so in aortic stenosis, when your valve doesn't work, as I said, you get it replaced with uh, either a surgical uh, valve or tr via transcatheter. Um, but these bioprosthetic valves are prone to degradation over time. 
Um, so we wondered whether sodium fluoride would be a useful marker of degradation um, before we can see it on CT and echo, which is generally very late. Um, and so we started by looking at um, explanted biprosthetic valves and perform micro PET CT and um, histology. And in summary, um, there are many different uh, mechanisms by which these valves degrade calcification, panis, thrombus, um, and nonspecific leaflet thickening, but they all had uh, PET uptake. Um, so we translated this into the fabulous study, which is where we recruited 80 patients with uh, bioprosthetic valves, um, and we followed them up um, and uh, we performed baseline sodium fluoride. Um, and essentially what we saw uh, in vivo was the same as what we saw um, in vitro in that um, these processes are all lighting up um, uh, this in the same way. Um, but most importantly, um, when we did follow them up, um, PET, baseline PET, was the only predictor of uh, valve deterioration, uh, biopsthetic valve deterioration, uh, making this a very, uh, potentially very powerful tool um, in uh, delineating which patients are high risk and which not. And again, if you wanted to um, set up a clinical trial, it would be a very useful marker um, for an early degeneration. Um, that you would get within one to two years rather than having to follow those patients up uh, for five or ten years until we see some hemodynamic changes. So, uh, in conclusion, sodium fluoride has provided very important insights into the pathological drivers of aortic stenosis. And the endpoint, uh, it's made a very useful clinical endpoint in clinical trials, uh, which is bringing down the cost and also means that we can see these changes early. Um, and our latest work is, uh, has shown that it's a, an early marker in biopsthetic valve degeneration. Um, so I just wanted to finish with our, um, uh, a summary slide again of all of the work that we're doing um, in cardiovascular diseases using PET, sodium fluoride PET in uh, cardiovascular diseases. Um, and to highlight uh, some very exciting work that I'm sure Dr. Slomka's lab next week will talk about um, in the coronary arteries, um, where at the uh, we're, we're moving away from the the vulnerable plaque, um, and we're looking much more at a at a patient level. So if you look at the um, the on a patient level, the amount of uptake in the coronaries, uh, this was a, a very powerful, indeed the best uh, predictor of uh, those with established coronary artery disease um, who were going to go on and have further events. Um, but I will leave that very exciting talk uh, for next week. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your attention. That was really a, a fabulous talk, Alexander. Thank you. Um, again, uh, if, uh, if anyone has any questions for Alex, uh, please put them into the chat and uh and i can read them uh while we're waiting on that i i had a few questions it's really nice to see how how this this work has evolved and you mentioned using in uh in clinical trials you also talked about the the repeatability and reproducibility of the measurement which of course is very important could you speak a little bit more about about how that's done and and how you make that objective in, in a way that can be then you know uh, transferred to other centers uh so in terms of how we uh, researched it or um, in terms of making it applicable to um, to other centers? Well, thinking about, um, you know, if you're doing a measurement in Edinburgh and we want to do the same measurement in, in, in Boston, um, how can you, how, uh, what, what sort of uh, pipeline do you put in place to, so oh, that, uh, to help ensure that we're both making the same type of measurement and getting the same type of results in a, in a multi-center study? Um, um, I, might, I might just chip in there. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, um, well, there's two things to this. So the first thing is that you need to develop a technique that is uh, easy to do and widely applicable and then publish the technique so that other people can read it and and then try and follow it. And so um, so I think we've tried to do that in, in 
uh, numerous publications. And then the second step is to do uh, multi-centre studies um, and uh, go to other sites and centres and try and establish uh, your technique uh, elsewhere. Uh, so I guess one example of that is the group in uh, in uh, Maastricht that we've been working with. So they're using uh, the pet technique as their endpoint in their trial, and that's uh, in close collaboration with us um, to develop the technique over there. Uh, and um, I guess more broadly in the kind of in with respect to coronary artery disease um Preston UB is leading the preferred trial which is a an international multi-center trial uh, looking at fluoride uptake in the coronary artery so uh that's got sites um uh, all across the UK uh North America uh and uh and uh, beyond and and so you know the technique is is then being used in those centers Thanks. Um, Brian, do we have any Brian, time? Have any time? Um, could, I talk, could I talk? Could I ask a question? We have to mute yeah. everybody. So we have one more minute. We have room for one more question, and then I will just close. Sorry, there was so there was one. Um, let's see. Hey, this is Jenny. Oh. This is Jenny Yan. Can I ask a question? Go ahead. Um, yeah, okay. So I just wonder you know, what kind of calcium forms in the classification is important for the detection of the sodium chloride. Um, so I think I didn't quite catch the question. So there's a lot of uh, interference on it. Okay, you show and you know, sodium fluoride is detecting classification. I wondered uh -huh. what kind of forms of the, you know, calcium in the classification, uh, uh, you know, is important for the sodium fluoride detection sensitivity. Sure. Um, so uh, there's been some work um, looking at um, the uh, co-localization of the fluoride to hydroxyapatite and shown uh, that it it definitely binds hydroxyapatite. And of course, that's, um, you know, the mechanism that's been established for 40 years in the bone. So I think that applies to uh, vascular calcification, but you're right in saying that there are other forms of uh, vascular calcification. So you can have amorphous uh, calcium phosphate. Um, we, we have tried to do some studies, we've got some unpublished data on that, uh, trying to link up the fluoride signal with synchrotron data. And it suggested that it also binds to amorphous calcium in the same way. That's non-published uh, uh, data. Um, so uh, that's about as, as much as I, I can tell you. I mean, it, it you know, the mechanism in, the, in terms of the hydroxyapatite is that it exchanges with hydroxyl groups on the hydroxyapatite. And those are also present in other forms of calcium. So presumably there's similar mechanisms there. Right. In this case, the trace it works is actually through competition, right, to form calcium fluoride. So therefore, um, not just the calcium total, it's different form of calcium will be very important for the detection sensitivity. And your data is, is marvelous. It's very interesting. Yeah, I think I think that's, yeah, that's a fact. reasonable hypothesis. But I, the data that we've got so far is that it binds similarly to amorphous calcium and hydroxyapatite. I don't know about other forms of crystals, and that would be an interesting study to look at. Okay, with this, uh, so um, okay. thank you for everybody for uh, uh, these great presentations, and thank you for the audience. And again, I want to highlight the the, the talk for next week, which is on valvular calcification and cardiovascular calcification in general and uh, i hope you can all attend and they this is these are the presenters and the discussion thank you so much and uh, i think it's time to close we are one a few minutes after the time thanks thanks everyone thank you